In this beginner tutorial, I'm going to introduce you to procedural nodes in Blender. So procedural nodes is a really cool feature in Blender and it will allow you to create some really cool things. So you can see right here up on the screen, these are a bunch of procedural materials that I've created using procedural nodes, but there's even cooler stuff you can do with procedural nodes. You may have seen online some really cool stuff where they use like displacements and they actually like create 3D models and things. And then they actually like texture it and animate it and do things like that. You may have seen that kind of stuff online. There's some really, really cool stuff you can do with procedural procedural nodes in Blender. And once you're finished watching this beginner tutorial on procedural nodes, then I'd highly recommend watching my procedural material playlist on YouTube. I'll have a link in the description to the playlist and I'll also throw a card right up there on the screen. In that playlist, I create a bunch of different procedural materials and I show you the entire process and go step by step and explain what I'm doing as I create it. So those procedural material tutorials would be a great thing to check out after you watch this video. I'll also be throwing timestamps in the video description and blocking out the different sections of this video. So if you want to watch a certain part, then you can check that out. And in the YouTube timeline, the timestamps will be displayed as well. So what exactly is a procedural material or procedural nodes? Well, what a procedural material is, is it's a material that doesn't use any external files. So for instance, you could go onto a website like Ambient CG, or you could go onto a website like CG Bookcase, and you could download some texture maps. Maps. And then you could put the texture maps into Blender and then you can plug them up and then it'll be a realistic material. And that works really well, but that's not a procedural material because you need some kind of external file or an image texture or an external texture map on your computer and you have to put that into Blender. So you can sort of think about procedural materials as you're kind of coding the texture. So you use different things like procedural noise textures and other things like color ramps. And you can also use math nodes and things like that. And you're creating those materials using the nodes which are built into Blender. And what's so cool about this is that they're adjustable so you can kind of change it and make it how you like. You can scale it up or down. You could have more rust or less rust. You can make the bump bigger or smaller. And once you have a good understanding of the procedural nodes, then you can go ahead and create your own materials. Real quick, before we continue the video, I wanted to thank this video's sponsor, Sketchfab buy, sell, and even upload your own 3D models on Sketchfab. My favorite feature of Sketchfab is that you can preview 3D models in your browser and even view them on a phone, tablet, or in AR and VR. They also have a huge 3D model store where you can purchase models and assets. You can even apply to sell your own models on the platform. Check out Sketchfab with the link in the description. So as I'm introducing you to the procedural nodes, I want something to preview the materials on. So what I did is I just pressed Shift A and I went over here to the Icosphere and then right behind me on those Icosphere settings, I just clicked on this and opened it up and then I turned the subdivisions way up to like a six, so it's very high detail. And then I just shaded this object smooth. Then what I also did is added a camera. I just pointed the camera right at this sphere here and then I also added in a sun lamp and I turned up the brightness a little bit and gave it a very slightly yellow color. And then for the world, what it is just went to the world and I clicked right here on the little yellow dot and I changed it to a sky texture. Then I played around with some of these settings and I just made this cool like evening kind of look. And this way it's just gonna give us some lighting on this sphere so that we can see our procedural nodes better. You could also just download like a free HDRI from polyhaven.com. Really it doesn't matter. You can just grab some simple base mesh and then just give it some decent lighting. And then let's go over to this shading tab. So I'm just gonna go into rendered mode right up here. And then right over here, I have the shader editor. So now what we can do is right up here, I can just click on new, and then we can just call this procedural material. I'm just gonna call it procedural material. And then also I am using cycles render. If you didn't notice that, I'm using the cycles render engine. If you wanna use Eevee, you can, but I am gonna be using cycles because cycles is more realistic. And there are a few nodes that don't work with Eevee. Most procedural nodes do work with Eevee, but I just like cycles better. Before we continue, though with the other procedural nodes I just want to go over the different shortcut keys so that you can navigate so if you want to select these nodes you can just click on them to select them that's pretty basic um, I'm using the right click select so I right click to select but on default it's left click select in blender so you're probably just gonna left click select so just select the nodes however you normally would select things in blender and then if you want to move around your procedural setup you can click and hold with your middle mouse wheel and then just move around and that's just gonna look around sort of like if you're in 
the 3D view in Blender, you can use your middle mouse wheel. You can use your middle mouse wheel in here just to move around and look around. And this is not gonna move the nodes, this is just moving your view. If you wanna move the nodes, you can just click on it and drag them. You can also press G to grab, just like in the 3D side of Blender, if you press G to grab, it's gonna move the objects. You can press G to grab and it's gonna move the nodes, or you can just click and drag. And then if you wanna select or deselect multiple nodes or all the nodes, it's uh, the A button. So just like the 3D side of Blender, it's A to select and A to deselect. And then what you can also do if you wanna just select specific ones is you can select one of them, hold down the shift key and then select the other one just like in the rest of Blender. Now you can also click and drag and that's gonna do this box select. Uh, you can also press B for the box select just like in the 3D side of Blender. Um, if you press T to open the T panel, you can see that on default we're on the select box so you can just click and drag and that's going to bring up the box select or you can just press B. Now, if you want to duplicate nodes, sometimes you do need to duplicate nodes, just like in the 3D side of Blender, it's Shift D. So Shift D will duplicate the node, and you can see that now I've duplicated it, so now we have two principal BSDFs. And don't worry if this is all a bit overwhelming, you don't need to remember all these shortcut keys right now, you can learn them in time. Now if you want to delete objects, again just like the 3D side of Blender, you can select it and then you can press X to delete, or you can also press the delete key and that will delete a node. Now you can see that this principal BSDF has this little wire right here, and the wire is going from the end of the principled, and it's going over into the material output, and then it's going into this socket right here. And while you're setting up procedural nodes, this is the workflow that you're gonna use. So you're gonna add nodes, and then you're gonna plug different nodes into each other, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna change different things. So you're gonna change these different values. You can see, like for instance, this is a base color, so you could like change it. I'll just make it like blue. And then you're going to plug things into each other. You can see there's all these slots here that you can plug things into. Now again, don't worry if this seems really complicated and there's a bunch here. Most of the time, you're actually not gonna use very many of these. There's just a few things that you're gonna use most of the time. Like for instance, a base color, you're gonna use that one a lot. And there are a few others. I will go over the main ones that you're gonna use. But back over to this wire here, you can see that this little wire is going over and then it's plugging into the, the material output. So as you're working with procedural nodes, you're gonna need to plug things up. You're also gonna need to unplug things and you also might want to cut wires if you wanna get rid of them. So you can just click and then drag and then let go to unplug it and then just click on the little dot drag over and you can see once you get really close it automatically connects it and you can just let go that is one way but for instance let's say that I like duplicate this so I'm going to select it press shift D now you wouldn't use two material outputs you'd only use one but let's just say that I click and drag and you can see there's another wire and I'm going to plug this up let's say that you have multiple wires and you want to cut all of them what you can do is you can hold down the control key and then right click and drag and you can see that your mouse turns into a little knife icon and then you can cut the wires and then just let go and you can see that it cuts both of them. So that is super useful if you've like set up a big thing and you have a bunch of wires and you just wanna cut all of them, you can do that. So another thing is that if you have a really big procedural setup and you have tons of nodes, you might want to organize them a little bit better and it might be a little bit confusing if you have like all these wires plugging into different nodes. So what you can do is you can add what's called a reroute. So how you add a reroute is you hold down the shift key and then you right click and drag. You can see this time it turns into a little crosshair and you can drag over the two nodes and then let go and you can see that it adds in this little reroute right here. It's just a little dot and if you're confused about which dot this is, like what data or what material is this, basically this is always just going to be an extension of the one behind it. So because this is a principal BSDF, it's just an extension for this. So once you have a really big complex setup, you can use this to organize your nodes a little bit better. Now this is totally optional and you totally don't need these but if you want to when you have a really big setup you could use that so you can hold down the shift key right click and drag and you can see it's going to add another one so you could like move this like for instance if you want to like go like this maybe move this up maybe add another one, something like this. You can see I can move this over. So you can see that the reroutes help a bit. Um, so it kind of routes up here, goes over here, but really it's just the same thing. It's not gonna change the material at all. You could just plug these up like this, and then you can just click on these and press X to delete. And that doesn't look quite as nice, but it's the same thing. So it's not actually gonna change the look of your shader. Now again, just like with the 3D side of Blender, if you are in edit mode and you wanna fill a face, 
if I just get rid of this, if you click on this and then shift click on this or just have them both selected, you can press F and just like in the 3D side of Blender, how that fills a face, F is going to fill these two wires together. And then there may be some cases where you want to delete a node, but keep it plugged up. So for instance, you don't need to follow me on this. You can, if you want to, I'm just going to click on the add here, and then I'm going to go right down here to shader and I'm going to add a mix shader right here. I'm going to add the mix shader and then I can actually just drop it right in here. So if you click on a node and drag it, you can see that if you put it in front of the wire or over the wire, the wire is actually going to light up. And then if you let go, Blender's automatically going to add it in. But then let's say I want to delete this. I could press X and delete and then plug this back up. But there's actually a quicker way to do this. So if I want to delete this, but then have this continue to be wired up instead of pressing X to delete and then replugging it up, what you can do is you can press Press control X and that way it's going to delete the node but it's going to keep it plugged up all right now before we really get into all the different nodes I want to introduce you to the node wrangler add-on now the node wrangler add-on isn't something that you have to install and then download it's actually built into blender so you just have to enable it so how you enable it is you go right up here to edit and then go to the preferences and then over here in the user preferences you're just going to click on add-ons and then right over here on the search, you're just gonna start to type in node and you can see that there is this node Wrangler add-on. So check mark that. And then if you want it to be in all your future Blender projects, you can click on the save preferences button. And if for some reason the save preferences button isn't there, it might be because the auto save preferences is turned on. And in that case, it would automatically save the preferences. So let's just close the user preferences now. So the node Wrangler add-on is an amazing add-on and it has quite a bunch of different features which can help you while you're creating your procedural setup. Now the main feature of the Node Wrangler add-on is to preview different nodes. So for instance, if I click on this principled BSDF and I press Shift D and click and drag it over here, and then just for a further example, I'm going to click on the add right here. I'm going to click on the search and I'm going to start to type in noise and then I'm going to add the noise texture. We'll go over this later in a moment, but now you can see that I have this noise texture and how you use the Node Wrangler add-on is you hold down the control and shift key at the same time. So hold down the control and shift key and then just click on any node. And what it does is it adds this little viewer node and then it plugs it up through the viewer node and goes into the noise texture. So what you can do is hold down the control and shift key and click on different nodes. And then this principled BSDF, I'm going to make it a red color. So then I can control shift and click back on this one. And this is the original blue one. And now we're back to how it is. But then if for some reason you want to go and just preview a specific part of your node setup, you can hold down the control and shift key and click on it. And then you can see what it looks like. So you can, you know, play around with this. Maybe you want to change the scale, the noise texture, things like that. And you can see what it looks like. But then when you want to go back and just preview the original thing, hold down the control and shift key and click on it and it's going to go back to how it is. So that is the main feature of the node wrangler. There are a few other features that it has, but that's the main one. All right. So when you add in a material onto an object, you're going to see this principled BSDF. And so this is the shader of the object. Because if you didn't have this, if I just delete it, you can see that it's black because it doesn't have any data of what it actually is. So what type of material is it? Is it like a glass material? Is it a glowing emission material? Is it like a water material or is it is principled? So on default, all the materials have the principled BSDF. For most things, generally, you're going to want to use the principled BSDF. And we will go over the other shaders in a moment. And then all of your nodes have to eventually be plugging up to the material output. So for instance, if you have a bunch of nodes over here and they're kind of plugging into the principle to give it more data. So, you know, what's the color, what's the normal, if it's like has some bump, different things like that. By the end of it, all the procedural nodes have to go into a material output and the material output is what tells it to go over here and actually be displayed on your object. Because if I just delete this, if you don't have any material output, it's not going to work. So you have to have a material output. So I'll just control Z that you have to have a material output. You can see if this this is not plugged into the material output, you can see that it's all black because it doesn't have any data to work with because you're not actually plugging anything into the material output. So you're just going to take this, plug it into the surface. All right, so let's get started with the different types of nodes. So the first type of nodes that we're going to go over is the shader nodes. So all the shader nodes have this green right here. So you know it's a shader node if it has this little green tab right here. So to add nodes, you can 
opinion, click right over here on the add, and then there's a bunch of different categories, and we're gonna go to the shader one. You can also click on the search. So once you remember what all the nodes are called, you can just click on the search, and then you can type in things. I use this a lot. I usually just click on the search and type it in because I know what I'm looking for. But if you still don't remember all the nodes, you can go through here and look at all the different nodes. Now you can click on the add here, but the shortcut key for this add menu is Shift A. So just like in object mode right here in the 3D view, if you press Shift A, you can add objects. So if you press Shift A in the shader editor, then you can add nodes. So here's the search. If you want to click on the search and you can type in things like the principled BSDF, things like that, I'm going to press Shift A. And then I'm going to go down here to shader. So all of these nodes, these are shader nodes, and these are all going to have the green tab. So because this is a beginner tutorial series, I'm just going to go over the main ones. So the first one that I want to show you is the emission. So let me go here, emission. I can click on this and you can see when I add it, it's going to follow my cursor and I can just click and drop it in. And you can see that this node is green because it is a shader node. So if I just click on this and drag it and drop it in, you can see that now it's it's previewing that instead of this one. So you can kind of think of the shader nodes as being the real life material. So what is it actually made of? Is it made out of rock? Is it made out of metal? Is it made out of some glowing lava or something like that? Um, now the principled BSDF is going to be most of them. So, you know, rock, dirt, sand, plastic, metal, things like that, you're going to use the principled. But then there are a few others, like for instance, if you maybe have a light bulb and you need it to glow, or maybe you're creating a sun object or some glowing lava, you're going to use the emission because the emission actually emits light. And then you can see that there are some different settings here. So there's like the color one. So you can change the color if you want to be like maybe some glowing lava, you could make it orange. And then you can also turn the strength up. So right here, the strength is set to one, you can turn this up and make it brighter and brighter. So now it's like super bright, glowing lava, or maybe this is a sun or something like that. So that is the emission. Now I'm also going to talk about the principled BSDF. So if I just drag this over here, now you can see it's connected and we can see it. So the principled BSDF is a node which you can make tons of different materials out of. And the principled BSDF actually right down here has an emission. So if you want to click on the emission, you can see there's a color, you can actually turn this up and it will actually emit light. So this emission node is actually built into the principled. The principled is basically the master node. So it has almost all the materials. You can make tons of materials with it, but you could also just use like an emission shader if you wanted to. And you can see there also is an emission strength. So you if you turn this up, make this like an orangey color on the little color tab right here. And then also there's the emission strength. So if you turn that up, it's almost like the same thing right here. If I just make this a little bit stronger, you can see it's almost the same thing. I'm just going to click on the color right here and turn it down to black. And then the emission strength, I'll turn that to zero. So you can click on the value and then you can actually type in numbers. So if I click on this, I can change it to zero and then hit enter. You can also click on the little arrows here and that's going to change them. So I can change it down to zero or you can also click and drag. All right, so let me just go over the main ones that you're going to be using. So you can see that there's this base color. The base color is pretty self-explanatory. You can just click on this color and drag it around. And then also later in the video, I'm going to talk about different nodes you can add and you can plug the nodes up to the base color. So instead of it using one color, you could, for instance, add a procedural texture and plug that in. And then instead of it using a color, it's going to instead use that procedural texture instead of the color. So another common Common thing that you're going to use is this metallic value. So this is pretty simple. If you're making a material that is metal, you're going to turn it all the way up to one. And then if you're making a material that is not metal, you're going to turn it all the way down to zero. So you can see if I turn it up to one, you can see now it looks like a metal shiny ball and I could maybe make it gray. So now you can see it's like metal and shiny. Or if you turn this all the way down, this just kind of looks like maybe plastic or something like that, or maybe clay. And then if you have a material that has some parts metal and some parts not like for instance you might have a scratchy metal material and the scratches the rusty scratches may not be metal because they're kind of scratched and old and worn maybe they have dirt on them but then the rest of the material is metal you could use for instance a texture and you would plug the texture into the metallic value and then instead of using one or zero it would actually tell it where 
on the shader it's going to be metallic and where on the shader it's not going to be metallic so we'll get into that later but basically if you want it to be all metallic you turn it up to one if you want it to be a not metallic at all you turn it down to zero or if you just want some specific places to be metallic you'll use different things like procedural textures and things like that all right let's go down to the next common one which is the roughness so for instance think of like a mirror a mirror is super super shiny or maybe think of like some car paint that's going to be really really shiny so if you turn this down down, you can see it's going to be more and more shiny and more and more reflective and you can see if I turn the roughness all the way down it's going to be super super shiny but then if you think of a, another material like maybe brick or rock usually bricks or rocks they're super super rough and you can't really see any reflection so if you're making a material like brick or rock or something that is not reflective you're going to turn this way up and now you can see that that's not reflective at all it's very rough so I'm just going to turn the roughness back to the default which is 0.5 so if I just click on it you can see I can change it so I can just type in 0.5 enter and there we go now it's right in the middle I'll just turn this back to a blue color so we're gonna go all the way down and we're gonna go right down here to the normal so the normal is basically a fake bump so for instance, think of something like maybe rock. A rock is going to be very bumpy, but you can see that this object right here is actually very smooth. So what you can do is you can use this normal to basically make a fake bump. And this doesn't actually change the object shape. So it doesn't actually change the shape of the mesh. What it does is it changes how the shader interacts with the light. So when the light comes down and bounces off of the object, it's going to change how that looks. And so it basically adds a fake bump and it makes it look like it's bumpy even though it's actually not so it won't actually change the shape of the object or the shape of the mesh it'll just make a fake bump in the material and I'll be showing you how to use this later in the video all right so that is the principled BSDF now let's just go over a few more common ones I'm gonna press shift a here and I can go to shader and I'm gonna go right down here to the mix shader so if I click on the mix shader I can add this one in now what this does is it actually mixes two shaders together so you can see here is one shader and here is one shader and then the shader output so these are the inputs and here's the output so what I can do is I can actually put this in front of these and then I can plug this one into this so if I use the node wrangler feature by pressing Control shift and clicking on the node go into rendered mode you can see it's black because it doesn't actually have any shading data so what I can do is if I drag these over here kind of drag this down I can actually pull out a wire and drop it in here and then I can pull out a wire and drop it in here and you can see that now it's going to mix them both together so it's actually mixing the emission with the principled and then this factor here this is going to tell it how much it's going to be of each one so if you drag it all the way down to zero you can see now it's only using the emission but if I drag it all the way up to one it's only using the principle so it's basically just going in between these two so I can just drag it kind of like this and now you can see it does look like a blue ball but then it also is a little bit glowing so this is very useful if you want to mix some things together for instance if you have an object that you want to be maybe the principled but then just some specific areas you want to be an emission you can add the emission and plug these two together and then it will mix them together so this is very useful if you want to mix two of them together and then earlier in the tutorial, I talked about the shortcut keys and I talked about how you can click on this and you can press control X and that way it'll delete it, but it'll keep it plugged up. And then actually, I just want to click on this and drag it and drop it in here. And then I can just click on this and press X and delete it. So let's go over another common one. So again, I'm going to press shift A here and I'm going to go down to shader. And another very common one is the glass BSDF. So I'm going to click on this drop it right here and then I can just plug it up so you can see it looks like a glass ball and this is really useful if you're making windows or if you're making like a glass cup really anything that's made out of glass this glass BSDF is super useful and you can see that just like all the other nodes there are some different settings so you can change the color so if you want to make some tinted glass you could change it so you can see now it's like red glass or blue glass or green glass or whatever you want to do and then there's also a roughness value so if you want to make it look like frosted glass or some glass that you can't quite see all the way through you could turn up the roughness and you can see now that I've turned that roughness up, you can see it is glass, but it looks really rough, sort of like a frosted glass or something like that. So let me just click on this and then just press X to delete it. Let's add in the last common one I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna press Shift A here and I'm gonna go right here to Shader and I'm gonna add the transparent. So let's click on the transparent, add it in. So this is basically just like what it sounds. It basically is just transparent. So if I just click on it and add it in, you can see 
that it's invisible. You can't see it at all. But then if you click on the color, you can change the color and you can see that now it is transparent, but only slightly transparent. So if it's white, it's going to be fully transparent. And then as you turn it down, you'll be able to see more and more of it. All right. So those are all the most common nodes. At least they're all the main ones that I use. There are more ones. You could definitely try these out. All right. So I'm just going to plug this back up. All right. So that is the first category. That is the shader nodes. All right, so let's go on to the second category of nodes, which are the texture nodes. So if you press shift A, you can see that right underneath it, there is texture. And these, these are the really cool things. So there's a bunch of different things here. Let me just go over the main ones that you're gonna use. So the most common one that you're gonna be using is the noise texture. So I'm just gonna click on it and then drop it right here. And then remember, you can press control and shift and click on the noise texture to preview it. And when you add in noise texture, you can see basically it just adds some noise. And then there's also the scale. So if you want to add more noise, you can change that up and you can see there's going to be more noise. There also is detail. So as you turn this up, there's going to be more and more detail in there. There's also the roughness. So if you turn the roughness way down, you can see it's almost going to get more blobby. And then if you turn the roughness way up, it's going to have a lot more detail. So you can see there it has lots of detail. You can just zoom way in. And then there's also distortion. So if you just turn the distortion up, you you can see it's kind of di getting distorted. This almost looks like maybe water or something because it's a little bit distorted. I'm just going to turn this back to zero. Now, as I talked about early in the video, you can take different textures and you can plug them up to the shaders. So the shaders, those are the actual real life materials. So what is the material made out of? Is it brick? Is it marble? Is it glass? Or maybe it's rock or dirt or sand. But then you can take the different texture nodes and you can plug them into the shaders. So for instance, this this noise texture, if I just control shift and click on it, you can see that it doesn't have any shading. So it doesn't have any reflectivity or anything like that. It's not interacting with the light because I'm just previewing it with the viewer. So let me just control shift and click back on this. If I want the noise texture to be contributing to the color, I can just click right here and take the factor and I can plug this into the base color. And you can see now, look at that. We can now preview this noise texture as our color for the principal BSDF. Now, if you control shift and click on this and then control shift and click on it again, you can see there is a color version of the noise texture and then there is a factor version. So the factor version is just black and white. And then if you control shift and click on this again, there is the color version and the color version is just basically a bunch of random colors. I usually use the factor, but if you want to, you could use the color. It really just depends on what you're doing. So if you want to use the color, I'm just going to control shift and click back on this. You could drag the color and drop it into the base color. And you can see now it's using the color. Now you may have noticed another thing, and that is that these little dots here have different colors. So the color one that is yellow. And what that's telling you is that it's color data. Now, all of the gray ones, the gray ones are kind of just like all the mismatch and all the other ones. So there's factors, there's metallic, things like that. The gray ones are sort of just all the general other ones, but then there is the yellow one, the yellow ones, the color one. And you can see that there's also these purple ones. So the purple ones are either normal data, or they are vectors. And we're going to be getting into vectors and normal later, but you can just remember that the purple ones are either like normal or vectors, and then the yellow ones are going to be color data, and then the gray ones are going to be other things, usually just black and white data. And then you can also see that there are green ones right here, and the green ones, these are the shader data. So the green ones are only going to be on the shaders, and you can see that there is a green one going over to this green one because this needs shader data. So this doesn't apply for everything, but generally speaking, you want to plug the same colors up to their own color. Now the gray ones, the factors here, the black and white data, those ones you can usually plug them into anything. Like it's not gonna mess up anything if you plug a gray one like this into the yellow one like this. I can control shift and click on this. You can see that totally looks fine. So the gray ones and the yellow ones can usually mix. But for instance, if you're taking something like this yellow one and you're plugging it into the purple one, you can see something is clearly wrong here. Something is broken with the shader. And that is because you don't want to mix the colors up, generally speaking. Like for instance, also I could duplicate this and maybe plug this uh, green one into this yellow one. And that's not going to work. You can see it's a red line and it's basically telling you that doesn't work work. You can't do that. Um, so you're not supposed to do that. And that'll just kind of mess things up. So just remember that generally speaking, the colors of the sockets need to go into each other. All right. So let's jump back over here to the different textures. So that is the noise texture. The noise texture is a very common one. I'm just going to delete it. 
and then I'll press shift A and let's go to the next common one. So another very common one is the wave texture. This is a really cool one. So I can control shift and click on it and you can see basically it just has these waves here and there's a bunch of cool things you can do. You can play around with these things like you can change it from bands to rings. That looks a little bit different. You can change the X, Y, and Z. So if you're familiar with the 3D side of Blender, there's the X axis, Y axis, and Z axis. So if you change this, it's going to change where the waves are rotated. And then there also is a few other settings here like shine and saw that looks a little bit different and triangle. So you can play around with these things. I'm just going to leave it at sign. And then just like the noise texture, there's a scale. So if you want to have more or less, you can change that. There also is a distortion. So you can see as I turn this up, it's going to be more and more distorted. And just like the noise texture, there's a detail. So it's just going to add random bits of detail. So that is super useful. And then there is some other ones you can play around with these like the detail roughness. You can see there's going to be even more detail and it's very rough. So I'm just going to delete this one. Let's just press shift A and go to texture. So another really common one, this is a very cool one, is the Veroni texture. If that's how you pronounce it, Veroni, I think that's how you pronounce it. So let me just control shift and click on this one. So you can see that again, they have different outputs. There's a distance. And then if I control shift and click on it again, it's going to go down to color. So here's some color data and then I can control shift and click on it again. And here's a position one. I'm just going to control shift and click on it again and that'll go back to the distance. So this one is really cool. There actually are a bunch of different settings here. And another really cool thing you can do is if you want to quickly switch between these, you can hover your mouse over the drop down and then you can hold down the control key and then you can scroll with your scroll wheel. So you can see as I scroll with my scroll wheel, holding down the control key, it's going to just cycle between them. So usually for most things, again, 3D is the most common one. And there are also some other cool things here and these all look different. So there's F2, you can see that looks pretty cool. There's smooth F1, so that's kind of like smooth. There's distance to edge. This is really cool if you're making like some cracked shader or something like that. So you can play around with these pretty cool settings you can change. And then there also is the scale, so you can change this one. Most of the procedural textures have scales, so that is super useful. So you can like turn the scale down. And then there is the randomness. So if you turn the randomness all the way down, you can see now these are all aligned. And then as you turn the randomness up, you can see that now they're all random. So that's super useful. You could use that for many things. All right, so that's the Verona texture. I'm just gonna delete this now and let's press Shift A again and we'll go to the next one. So another really cool one is the checker texture. So I'm just gonna add this in, Control Shift and click on it. And you can see it's basically just a checker look. So there's color one and color two, so you can change the different colors. So for instance, if you want to make like a checkerboard, you could make the color one be like a red color and then color two could be black. And now it looks kind of like the board from the checkers game. Uh, you could also, if you want to make like a chessboard, maybe like a wooden chessboard, you could have one of them be brown like this and then you could have another one maybe be like a darker brown, something like that. So now maybe that's made out of wood. And then there also is a scale as well. So that has the checker texture. Let me just delete this one. I'm going to press shift A. I also want to show you another really cool one, which is a brick texture. So this is very cool for making bricks. So I can just control shift and click on this. So if you want to make bricks or tiles or things like that, this is really useful. Now you can see that it places it a little bit weirdly. Later in the video, we're going to be getting into how you can actually change where the texture is. And we're going to be using the vector for that. So there are actually nodes where you can tell it where you want it to be. So you can see that right over here, it's not stretched. If you wanted to move this down here, you could actually use nodes and tell it where it's going to be placed. So for now, I'm just going to look at it from the top view. So there is the offset. Now you can see that kind of just looks like the checker texture. I'm just going to turn the offset all the way up to one. There's some other things here you can play around with. There's also the colors. So if you want to have it maybe be like kind of a reddish brick wall, there are some brick walls that are kind of more a red color. And then there is the mortar and the mortar is like in between. So you could make that maybe like a gray color or a brown color. And then there's some other cool things here you can play around with like the mortar size, how smooth it is. You can also change the brick width and the brick height or the row height, different things like that. So this is a super useful texture. I have a tutorial on how to create procedural tiles. Um, so if you wanna watch that, link's in the description. It's also in my playlist, and I use the brick texture to create it. 
I'm just gonna delete this now, let's go over another one. Just a couple more though that I'm gonna show you. Uh, there is a Musgrave texture, this is a really cool one, you can do some really cool things with this. So you can see this kind of looks like the noise texture, but you can do some different things with it, like play around with the scale. You can also change the detail here, again, this is very common, the detail. I can also click right up here and change these things, and you can see they all look different. Ooh, that looks pretty cool. So there's many uses for the Musgrave texture as well. All right, I'm just gonna delete Delete this one and then one more that I'm going to show you in this video if I press shift a go to texture you can see there is this magic texture so this is a pretty cool one I'm going to control shift and click on this this one looks very cool it's very colorful and this is almost like a seed value it's kind of just random and it'll just give you random colors that's pretty cool so I don't use this one very much but it is a pretty cool one so I just wanted to show you it there's a scale value you can also change the distortion Oh, that looks really cool. So yeah, this is a cool one. I don't use it very much, but I just wanted to show you it. So I'll press X to delete it, and I'll just press Shift A, and I'm going to, you can click on the search if you want to find a specific one. I'm going to search for the noise texture. So I can click on search, type in noise, and then I can find it and just drop it in here. And then I'm going to take the factor and plug that up to the base color. And then I just need to control and shift and click on the principle to preview it. Maybe change the scale, just turn it up. And I think I'll turn the detail up all the way up to 16, so it's detailed. All right, so that is the second type of procedural nodes, the texture nodes. And I don't think I said this earlier, but you probably figured it out. All of the texture nodes have orange. So they have this orangey brown color, and that way you can know that they are texture nodes. So just like all the shader nodes have green, these all have orange. All right, so let's go to the third type of textures, which is the input textures. So if you press Shift A, you can see right up here there is input, and there are a bunch of different ones here. Again, I'll just go over the main ones that you're gonna use. So the main one that you're gonna be using is the texture coordinate node. So if I click on this, I can just drop it right down here, and you may notice two things. You might have noticed that these are all purple, and so these are all going to deal with the vectors. And you also might have noticed that these are red. So all of the inputs, they're all going to be red. As you can see here, these are all red. So that's a good way to remember that all the input nodes are red. Now the main thing that the input nodes do is they tell the textures where they're going to be placed on the object. So they're going to define how the texture is placed and where it's placed. So that's what the vector deals with. So just to show you, I can go back into rendered mode right here. Now this noise texture needs some default vector. It needs some way to know how it's going to be placed on the object. So each texture, if it doesn't have a texture coordinate plugging into it or anything in the vector plugging into it, then it needs a default vector. And so the default vector is generated. So you can see if I take the generated and plug it into the vector, then nothing's going to change. You can see here it is before and here it is after. So if you don't have anything plugged into it, it's just gonna use this generated. Now I can control shift and click on this and I can continue to click and I can go down and down. And there's a bunch of different ones here. There's normal, UV, object, camera, window, and reflection. And these things tell the texture how it's gonna be placed on the object. So I can just control shift and click back on this. So the generated, that's the default. So if I just plug this in to the vector, so purple's going to purple, that's gonna stay the same. If I change it to normal, now it looks a little bit different because what it's doing is it's using the normal of the object. If you plug in the UV, it's going to use the UV map of the object. So you can see now, you can see it's kind of stretched and that's because if I tab into edit mode and I go U and unwrap, you can see it unwraps it. I can do like the smart UV project and now you can see it's gonna act differently, but you can see there's some seams and that's because now it's using the UV map. So if you're familiar at all with UV unwrapping and texturing, that's basically what it's using. So it's using the UV map of the object. If you go into the UV editing tab, you can see here is the UV map and you can do some different UV maps. Like you could press U and do the cube projection. That would be a little bit different. And then I'll just go back to the shading tab and you can see that now it looks a little bit different. So that is the UV. So depending on how the UV mapping is, it's going to change. Like here is the sphere projection. That looks a little bit different. It's a bit stretched. Let's go on to the next one, which is the object. So this one is super useful. And for most procedural setups, you're gonna be using the object one. And why the object one is so great for procedural texturing is because it very evenly place the texture all around and you're not really going to have any stretching or anything like that unless of course you stretch the object if you stretch the object of course then it's going to be stretched although if you pressed Control a 
and then you applied the scale. Now you can see it's not going to be stretched and the texture looks fine. I'm just going to control Z that though. So the object mapping works really well and it applies pretty much to any mesh. So for instance, if I press shift A and maybe I add a cube, then I can like bevel this. You don't need to follow me on this. But now if I want to take this and select the cube, I can just add the procedural material. You can see it actually works pretty well on different objects because it's using the object mapping and it just very nicely places the texture very evenly around the object so the object mapping works really well there also is some others like the camera so if you plug this into the camera one so if i just go into the material preview now you can see that that's what's happening so it applies the texture to where the camera is located. So depending on where the camera is located, it's going to change. I don't use this for very many things, but you may use it in some cases. There's also a window. So if you change it to window, now you can see that as I'm rotating, it's not changing where the texture is. And there also is the reflection one. And that one is a little bit different as well. You can see it kind of reacts to the reflection. So where the object would be more reflective, kind of on the sides here, you can see it looks a bit different. Now this is a beginner tutorial so you really don't need to memorize these don't worry about any of these all you need to remember mainly is the object one and that's really good for procedural textures or if for some reason you want to use the UV map you could or generated but really for most procedural textures you're going to use object so so for almost all of my procedural material tutorials I just use object because that works really well so let's go over the other ones. So let's press shift A here. I'm just gonna to go to input. Another common one is the geometry one. So we can add the geometry one and you can see this has even more stuff. So let me just plug these different inputs in and then we can see how it changes. So there's position and you can see this is going to change when the position of the object changes. So that is pretty cool. So if for some reason you want it to change when the position changes, you could do that. There's also normal as well on the geometry node. There's also normal right here. And there are some other ones. You could try these different ones out if you want to, but there's one really cool one, which is the pointiness. And what the pointiness value does is it makes the parts of the mesh that are coming out lighter, and then the crevices and creases of the mesh, it makes that darker. Now I actually have a tutorial on how to use the pointiness value you. I'll leave a link in the description and a card right up there on the screen. But let me just show you what you might use it for. So I'm just going to add like a monkey and then I'll maybe bring this up. You don't need to follow me on this if you don't want to. And then I'm just going to add that procedural material. Now, if you're in EV, this unfortunately isn't going to work because the pointiness value doesn't work in EV. It only works in the cycles render engine. But you can see here, if you zoom in, it's already starting to do something. So I'm just going to control shift and click until I can preview it. But you can see that the crevices are a bit darker and then the corners or the parts that are kind of up higher, it's making that lighter. Now I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but you can definitely watch that tutorial on how to use Blender's pointiness value. Link is in the description. But there's just an example of what it looks like. So I will just delete this and then we can just bring this back down and then I'll also delete the geometry node. All right, let's press shift A and I'm gonna to go to input. And the next one that I wanna show you is the value. So this is basically just a number value. So for instance, if you wanted to change two values at the same time, what you could do is for instance, this value here, you could plug it into the scale and you can see it's gray and it's going into gray. And this doesn't have any texture data or anything like that. It is just an input because it's red and so it's going from here into here so it's now a new input and now instead of it using this scale it's going to use the scale of the value node so if you want to change the scale and the detail at the same time you could plug these both up and now if I just control shift and click on the noise texture I can scale this value and it's going to change the value for both the scale and the detail because again instead of it using their own scale and their own detail I'm plugging these up and so now it's only using this value instead so this is very useful for a lot of things if you want to animate values this is really useful and also if you want to change multiple values at the same time this is very useful so I'm just going to delete that now. Let's press shift A and I'll go back to the input. And there's another cool one I want to show you, the layer weight node. So I'm just going to click on this and add it in. Now you can see that unlike this one, this one actually does have some input. So you can actually input stuff into the layer weight and then output it. So for instance, if you wanted to take the object, plug that into the normal, then you could plug these into the noise texture. So let me just control shift and click on it so you can see what it's doing. So basically what the layer weight node does is it makes the parts on the edges here when you are looking at the object 
more from a side view like when you're looking at the faces from side view it makes that lighter and then the faces that you are looking on more straightforward that's going to be a grayer color so there's the fresnel and then you can also control shift and click on this and there's the facing and then there is a blend value that you can change that so you can make it lighter or darker so if you want to make it more contrasty you can do that so how might this be useful well it might be useful for instance on like an atmosphere on a planet this would be very useful because maybe if you're making a procedural planet I actually have a tutorial on how to create a procedural planet you might want to have an atmosphere and just have like some blue on the edges so you could use this and then you would of course need to change it so you need to to edit the colors to make it kind of blue and then you could maybe plug that through an emission so that it's a glowing atmosphere that's just an example you could definitely watch my procedural planet tutorial link will be in the description so that is the layer weight node i'm just going to delete this now and again there are a bunch of them but i'm just going to show you one more common one so the last one that i want to show you is the object info node so let's just add this in and just put it down here so this is a pretty cool one especially the random value this is really cool so if i take the random i can plug the random into the base color so it looks a little bit complicated here let me just control shift and click on the principle so let me just move these out of the way so i just want to plug the random into the base color i don't need to go into this one so i'm just going to plug the random into the base color and then what i can do let me just scale this down move it over to the side if i press shift d to duplicate this you can see that they're actually different colors. So this one's a little bit lighter, this one is a bit darker. I can press Shift D again, oh, it's a lighter one. And there's another one, I'll press Shift D. You can see that one's very light. So basically this has a random value and what it does is it makes each object that has the material a random color, slightly different. Now right now it is only black and white, it's kind of just like white and gray, but you can actually play around with this by adding nodes in here to edit the colors. So all we need is this white and black value and we can edit the colors and we could just make like different colors and this is going to lead me into the next group of nodes which is the converter nodes so i'm just going to press shift a and you can see right down here there is converter now there's a bunch of different things here i'm just going to show you the most common ones so there is this color ramp let's click on this and then you can see that if i just drag over this wire turns a white color and i can just drop it and you can see that it's automatically going to connect it up so now i can control shift and click on this color ramp now you also may have noticed that this is another color it is blue so when i press shift a i go to converter you can see that all of the converter nodes are blue so that is very helpful i'm just going to delete these so with the color ramp if i control shift and click on that you can see that here is what we're seeing so this is the random value and the color ramp right now it's not really doing anything if we had color data it would convert it to black and white because it's a converter node but what i can do is i can actually change the colors in between this value so we can take the random value we can convert it through the color ramp node the color ramp node is a converter node and then we can change the colors and then that can go into the base color so you can see that the color ramp node has a black tab and a white tab and you can actually drag these tabs around you can also click on the plus here if you want to add a new tab in between and you can also click on the minus if you want to delete it now each tab has a color that you can change so you can see right here there is this color and if you click on this then it will give you this color palette and you can change the color so I can just change this to for instance like a green color and then I can also drag this and you can see that when I drag these two together it's going to be more and more contrasty because you can think of this random as being all of these different objects they're going to randomly be dropped in here and so if these are closer and closer together there's a more likely chance that they're going to be green or white white and not in between. So it's going to make it more and more contrasty if you drag them together. If you drag them out, if you drag them really far apart, there's a lot more of a fade in between the green and the white. And so you can see some of them are sort of like a light green. So this one I can also change. So if I click on the white tab, I can click right here to change the color. So maybe this one, I want to make it blue. And now you can see it's blending between green and blue. I can also click on the plus here to add a new one. And so this one, I could make another color, maybe like red and you can see that now we have a bunch of different colors because if you're mixing red and green there's going to be yellow and orange in between and now if i just start to duplicate these you can see that randomly they're going to be generated as different colors now if i take away or remove the random then that's not going to happen you can see that it's just going to be whichever one is in the middle so if i turn this to green now it's going to be green 
or I can just drag the blue over and now it's going to be blue. So you need that random data because this is an input node. The input node is going into the color ramp and then the color ramp is converting it to these different colors. And then that's going to go right through here to the base color. So I can just control shift and click on that. And you can see that now we have a bunch of different colored balls. And when I press shift D to duplicate them, they're all different colors. So that is the color ramp node. It's very cool and it's a very common node. So let's press shift A. I'm gonna go down here to converter and another common one, a very useful one is RGB to black and white. So if I click on this, I can just drop it in and then I wanna drop it like right in here cause you can see yellow going to yellow and then the gray, that's fine if it goes in there because this is color, so it's yellow and then the gray one, that is just black and white. So it's converting it from color to just black and white. So I can just drop it in here. And then if I control shift and click on this, you can see it's color. And then if I control shift and click on this, you can see now it's just black and white. So that's a super useful one. I'm just gonna press X to delete that. If I press shift A and go to converter, there also is another common one and it's the math node. So I'm just gonna drop the math node right here. So the math node is sort of like a calculator. It basically does math for us. So it's super useful in many cases. Let me just give you an example. So I'm just going to move these three nodes out of the way and then I'm just gonna take the noise texture and bring it over here. Then I'm gonna take the factor and I'm gonna plug that into the first value. So I can now control shift and click on this and you can see here's the noise texture going into the first value. And then if you click right here, there's a bunch of different things you can tell the math node to do. So the main ones that you're probably gonna use are add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So let's say that I want to add a value from a texture into another texture. So I'm gonna press Shift A and I'm gonna to go to texture and I'm just gonna add the checker texture. I'm just gonna drop it down here. And then what I wanna do is make this one, the top one, fully white and then the black one fully dark. So I'm just going to control shift and click on the checker texture. So for instance, let's say that I only want to show the noise texture where the black part is on the checker texture. So I only want to add the noise texture to the black parts of the checker texture. What I can do is I can take the factor, plug that into the bottom one, and then the factor of this one, I can plug that into the top one. So instead of using these number values, we're actually using the data from these textures. If I control shift and click on this now, you can see because this is set to add, the math node is going to add the noise texture wherever the checker texture is black. So you can see right here, the noise texture. Here's the checker texture. It's black right here. If I control shift and click on this, you can see it's only adding the noise texture where it's black. And then where it's white, it's just staying the same. And then you can change this. So for instance, you could change it to subtract instead. And now you can see that the white squares are gonna be black instead of white. And then there are of course a bunch of ones here. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but you can see how that could be used. And then this value could be plugged into the base color. And now you have that. So that is the math node, super useful. I'm just going to click on this and press X to delete it and click on this one and press X to delete it. And I'll just move these a bit back into place. I'm also just going to select all the extra balls and I will just delete them because all we need is this one So let me just scale this up and put it back into place. All right So that's the basics of these blue converter nodes I'm just going to delete the color ramp and I'm going to delete the object info and then let me just set up this basic setup So I'm just going to set the object to the vector and then I'm going to set the factor to the base color So now we can just preview the noise texture So for instance, what if we want to scale or transform this noise texture? Well, this leads me into my next group of nodes, which are the vector nodes So if you press shift a you can go right down here to vector and you can see that there are some different vector nodes what I'm going to do is add a very common one, which is the mapping node. And then I'm just going to drop this down here. So this mapping node is going to allow you to change the location, rotation, or scale of whatever it's plugging through. So we want to use the object. So the object is going through the vector and then that vector is going into the noise texture. So the vector is going to tell it where the noise texture is going to be placed on the object. So for instance, there's location. So we could change the X location. Let me just go into the material preview so you can see this a little bit better. So you could change the X location. You can see now it's kind of moving along there. We could change the Y one that's going back and forth or the Z one. You can see now it's moving up and down. There's also the rotation. 
happened. So you can see that now I'm rotating it and it looks like I'm rotating the sphere, but actually I'm just rotating the texture on the sphere. So that's super cool. If for some reason you just want to change where it is, you could do that. And then there's also scale. So you could kind of squish it down. You could change the Y one that's going back and forth or the Z one, you could squish it down if you wanted to. So the mapping node is going to change how the noise texture is placed on the object. Let's press shift A and I want to show you one more. There are quite a few here, but the second most common one that you're probably going to be using is the bump. So let's just add the bump in. So the bump is a little different. It doesn't quite work like back here behind the noise texture. What the bump node does is it actually converts the input. So if you input something, it's going to convert that to normal data. So you can see there is a gray height one right here. And there also is some other ones, but the height one here is what we're going to be using in this video. So there's a height one going in here and then it converts it and it comes out as purple, which is the normal data. You can see it says normal. So if you were watching in the earlier part of this video, I was talking about how you don't want to mix these. Like for instance, this factor, the gray one, you don't want to mix that with purple because there are some shading issues. Well, if you take the bump node and plug it in here, and then what you want to do, because you don't want to mix these, you don't want to mix gray and purple. So you want to take the gray one, plug that into the height and then unplug this. You can now see that it's actually converting that to normal data. So it's basically now acting like a normal texture map. If you've downloaded a texture pack, if you've downloaded some textures, you may have seen that there's like a normal one. And if you've plugged that through, this is adding that fake bump that I talked about earlier in the video. And that way we can use the data from the noise texture and actually plug it into the normal because normally without this, if you just plug the gray into the purple, that wouldn't work. It wouldn't work because you can see now there's all that shading issue. So this converts it from the gray values. So this black and white, it converts it to normal data. If you plug it into the height and then the purple can go to the purple. And this is really great for creating procedural rocks. So if you want to create a procedural rock shader, this works really well. I have a tutorial on how to create that link will be in the description. So these two ones are the main vector nodes that you're probably going to be using the mapping and the bump. At least these are the main ones that I use. All right, so now let's talk about the last big category of nodes. If I press shift A, they are the color nodes. So the color nodes is going to allow you to add colors and edit colors in your procedural setup. So there's a bunch of really cool ones here and these are really easy to use. Let's just go over the main ones. So the RGB curves is the main one that I use. So let's click on it and we can just, for instance, drop it right here. And you will notice that once again, it has a color. So all of the color nodes are yellow. And that actually makes a lot of sense because the outputs and inputs are also yellow and these ones are colors. So all of these color nodes are yellow. So you can see these ones are all yellow. So that is very useful. Useful. I'm just going to delete these. So let me just show you the RGB curve. So if I just control shift and click on this, uh, you can see what it looks like. Now this is just gray. And so there actually isn't any color. So I just want to take this color right here and instead plug it into the color. And that way we're actually using the color of the noise texture instead of just the factor. There's the C one, there's the R and the G and the B. So the C one, this is going to change how bright or dark it is. So you can see if I click and drag, it's going to add the dot and then the dot is going to move the curve and the curve will edit the colors. So if I drag it down more over to this corner, it's going to be darker. And if I drag it up over to this corner, it's going to be lighter. And you can also click and drag and make more dots. So if you want to make it more contrasty or something, you could like make it dark here and like pull this up. And you can see that's, that's almost like a tie dye look. That's actually really cool. And then if you want to delete these, you could just click on them and then you can click on the X here to delete it. So the C changes the brightness or the darkness. Let's go to the next one. Actually, I'm going to make this a little bit brighter. And then let's go to the next one, which is the red value. So R is for red, G is for green, and then B is for blue. So on the red values, if I drag it more towards here or more down here, it's going to make the red stronger or make them less strong. It's going to add more red or remove more red. So I can just drag this up. You can see now it has a lot more red. I can click on the G one for green. I could drag this up if I want more green or maybe I want less green. So now it's kind of more purplish. And then if I click on the B that is for blue, I could drag it up more if I want more blue. And you can see now it's more like a pink because 
red and blue together, make like a pinkish purplish. And if I want to remove the blue, I could just remove a bunch of it. And now it almost looks like lava colors because the blue is almost gone. There's almost no blue. So that is very useful. I use the RGB curves node all the time. Let me just show you some other common ones. So I'll just press X to delete this and then I'll press shift A. Let's go to color. There also is the brightness and contrast. This is super useful. So I can take the color plug it into the color and then the color into the base color so we can actually preview it. Or you could just control shift and click on the brightness and contrast. So this is pretty self-explanatory. The brightness is gonna make it brighter and the contrast is gonna make it more contrasty. So there we go, very cool. This time I'm going to press control X and control X will delete the node but keep it plugged up. Let's just press shift A again and let's go to color. The next one I'm gonna add is the mix RGB. So we're gonna add this in. So this one sort of works like the math node. It's similar because you can see it has these different things here. And there are some other things here like color dodge and screen and overlay, things like that. So what this will allow you to do is, is it will allow you to mix different colors together in different ways. So there's color one, there's color two, and then there is a factor. So if I just take color two and I make it maybe like a bright red color, now, if I control shift and click on this, you can see that as I change these, if I change it all the way to zero, it's only gonna use the noise texture, but if, but if I change it all the way up to one, it's only gonna use color two. So color one and color two. And then right now it's set to mix, that's gonna be evenly mixing them together, but you could also change it to different things like darken or lighten, and you can also add values into the factor. So for instance, what I could do is I could take this factor and plug it into the factor. So instead of using just an even value back and forth, we're actually going to use the factor of the noise texture. So we're gonna use this data to tell it to make it color one or color two. So I just need to change this back to mix because mix is just the default. And then if I control shift and click on this, you can see that it's kind of just gray. It isn't very strongly white or strongly black. So what I could do is I could press shift A and I could search for the brightness and contrast. Now I can drop the brightness and contrast right in here. So what I wanna do, sorry, this is getting a little bit complex, is the factor needs to go to the color and then the color needs to go to the factor. So what we're doing is we're using this as our factor to tell it where it's gonna be color one and where it's gonna be color two. So I can just turn up the brightness just like a little bit and then I can turn the contrast way up so it's very strong. So you can see now the brightness and contrast has made that very bright and contrasty. So now instead of using the factor number, instead of just evenly blending in between them, plugging the brightness and contrast into the factor is going to tell it where it's gonna be color two, which is red, and where it's gonna be color one, which is this. And to make this even simpler, I could unplug this and then just change this to maybe like a blue color. Now you can see that it's using this data to tell it where it's gonna be color one and where it's gonna be color two. So that is super helpful. The mix node, very useful. I'm just gonna delete this and delete this one as well. So I'll go over here to color. You can of course try these all out, but I'm gonna show you another common one, which is the invert node. So I'm just gonna drop this in here. So it's really basic. It literally just inverts whatever data you give it. So if I take this factor, plug it into the color here, then I can control shift and click on this. You can see if I control shift and click on this, here it is before, and then I can control shift and click on this and it inverts it. So this part here, you can see there's a little white patch, it inverts it and now it's gonna be a bit of a dark patch. So pretty simple, it just inverts whatever value you give it. All right, so we're getting towards the end of the video, but there's just a few more things that I wanna show you. And these are ways that you can better organize your nodes. So if I just press shift A right here, you can see that right down here, there is a layout and there is this reroute. So if you add the reroute, we talked about this in the beginning of the video, but if you hold down the shift key and right click and drag, you can add these reroutes. So for instance, if you didn't like how this is kind of going over, maybe you want to go down and then over, you could hold down the shift key and right click and drag over. And then you could just like drag this down, maybe like that, maybe add another reroute, move it up here, and then you could like pull this down and you can see that now it looks a lot nicer. So if you like this better, you could do that. This is really just personal preference though, because this reroute is just a duplicate of whatever this output is. So the output just continues to go down here and then it just goes in there. So you could hold down the shift key and then right click and drag to add the reroute. You could also just press shift A and then go to layout and add a reroute. And it's gonna add that little dot there. Now you can also see under layout, there is this frame and the frames are super useful if you add them in. Basically you can add frames to different groups of nodes. So for instance, if you wanted to add all these to a frame, 
frame, you could then move them around and they'd all be connected in the frame. So I can drag this and dr bring it over and then I can just click and drag and drop it into the frame. And you can see now when I drag the frame, the nodes in the frame are gonna move along with it. So I can box select these and drop them both in the frame, drop it in and then if I drag this over, you can see now I can move the frame so once you get really, really complex procedural setups, like for instance, in my procedural planet tutorial, that was a pretty complex node setup, the most complex one I've ever done. It's really complex. And so I use these frames to help me organize the nodes. You could also just delete this frame. And if I just select all of these nodes, you can press control J and that's going to add a frame. So just like in the 3D side of Blender, if you want to join objects together, you press control J. Well, it's the same here. You can just like box select these, press control J and now it's going to add these all in. And then if you want to delete the frame, you can just click on it and press X to delete it and it won't actually delete the nodes inside the frame unless you have the nodes selected as well. If you have the nodes and the frame selected and press X to delete, it'll delete all of them or you can just press X on the frame and delete the frame. Now the frames can be used to organize the nodes so you can actually name the frame. So if you press N, that's going to open up this side panel and you can see that there is a name and a label when you select the frame. So for instance, I could just call this noise, hit enter, and then the label, you also need to change that. So noise, and you can see now it actually says noise right there. There also is a color right here. So if you turn on the color, you could actually change it. So if you want it to be like blue, that's pretty cool. All right, I'm just going to delete the frame. So using frames is a super easy and effective way to organize your nodes. Now there's just one more way that I wanna show you on how to organize your nodes. What you can do is you can actually join nodes together and then create a node out of those nodes. So how you do this is you can just select the nodes. So for instance, I'm just going to select these two and then you can press control G. Now when you press control G, it's going to add these into their own nodes. So you're sort of like creating your own node. It's pretty cool. You can basically create your own node. Now when you do this, it automatically plugs up these group inputs and the group outputs. So what you do now to get out of this is you press tab. So if you press tab with this selected, it's going to go inside the node. And then if you press tab again, that's gonna go outside of the node. So you can actually create your own nodes. So it's really cool. Now, if you press N, you can also rename this. So I can call this maybe noise. And then the label is gonna be noise. And then there also is this node group here. I could also call this one noise. So that is super cool. And then just like edit mode, if you press tab, you're gonna go into edit mode. If you tab into this, you're basically gonna go into an edit mode of the node. So it's pretty cool. And then you can see here's the mapping and the noise texture. And then the object is being plugged into the vector. Now let's say that I wanted to plug this into the color. So maybe I just take the factor and I plug that into the base color. But you can see if I control shift and click on it, it's only the the black and white. And in this case, I actually want to plug the color value right here, this color value into the principle. I'm not actually able to access this color right here. So what you can do is if I tab right here, what you can actually do is you can actually plug the inputs and the outputs into these empty sockets right here. And then when you tab back into object mode or go back out here to the node, it'll actually be right here. So let me just show you. So for instance, I could just take this one, plug it into here, and then it's gonna add another one, plug this one to here, it's gonna add an extra one, and plug this one to here. So these ones are all the inputs. So if I tab back into object mode, you can see that now this noise node that we created actually has a location, rotation, and scale. Um, in this case, I don't really want them, so I'm just going to unplug them. So let me just unplug all of these. And then you can see that for some reason it still keeps it even though I unplugged it. So what you're gonna have to do if you wanna get rid of that is just tab into the node and then click on the node input and then you're gonna to have to click right over here on a group and you can see that there's the vector, location, rotation, and scale. You just need to click on this and then press minus and then press minus and then press minus and it'll get rid of that. So that is really cool. And you can also do that for the outputs. So if you want certain outputs of the custom node that you created, you can take the color and plug that in here and you can also do whatever you want. So if you have more outputs, you can plug them up. And then if you tab, out of the node, you can see that now it has a color. So if I control shift and click on this, there we go. There is the color data that we're looking for. And I can just take the color, plug it in the base color. And now you can see that it has that color right there. Let me just turn down the strength of the bump. 
so that you can see that. So now you can see that we actually have our own custom made node. And with that said, this is going to wrap it up for my beginner tutorial on how to use procedural nodes in Blender. Now I would highly recommend checking out the playlist where I have a bunch of different procedural material tutorials. So if you want to check out that playlist, you can watch some different procedural material tutorials and all of those tutorials are created for beginners. So they're all in real time and step by step. And I add each node and I explain why I'm using them. So watching those tutorials, is a great next step to learning procedural nodes in Blender. So again, you can check out the playlist with the link in the description. And also, if you'd like to help support this channel, a great way to do that is by purchasing my procedural material packs. So I'll be creating more procedural material packs as I make more, but for the time being, I have two procedural material packs, and each one has 10 procedural materials created with Blender. And you can purchase those on my Gumroad store as well as some other 3D model sites. And also, if you join my Patreon, then you can get those over there. So if you join my Patreon, you'll be getting those procedural materials, and you'll also help to support the channel each month. So that's going to be it for this tutorial. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope the tutorial was helpful. And I hope to see you in a future video.